One of the most important things you're ever going to learn in life, and it's important that you learn early on, is to never overplay your hand. Now, this is an old gambling term, poker term, and what we mean is don't bet more than you can lose. Know your limitations. Don't overestimate yourself. Don't underestimate your opponent. Uh, be humble enough to change your course and understand that uh, feigning weakness, appearing to be weak, may be a benefit or an advantage to you. Uh, always be upping your game. Don't be cocky. Don't be arrogant. Now, what is your hand in life? What is your hands? Anything that you've been given to work with. In whatever arena you find yourself in, whatever station you find yourself at, you're always going to be expected to respond and to have a hand to play. So you have to play to your strengths and you have to play to your weaknesses. You have to know your limitations, but you have to be paying attention to whatever it is you're up against. Now, you're going to be up against a lot in life. Not all things come at you baring their teeth and threatening you, but uh, there's always... There can, there's always going to be some kind of opposition. There's always going to be a challenge, and these things can be these things can be uh, something that uh, sharpen you, or they can destroy you. They can humiliate you. So you have to know your limitations, and you have to know how to play the game. I remember years ago when I was very young, and brash, and cocky, and arrogant. I remember having an argument with my father one time, and I told him, I said, I don't play games. <laughs> and my dad told me, he goes, everyone plays games. You have to play games in life, and you better learn how to do it or you won't survive. And it was, it was some of the best advice he ever gave me. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you three illustrations of how games were played, and you can kind of suss it out and find out um, who overplayed their hand. I think you're really going to enjoy them. There are two that come from real life, and there's one that's just a little silly, but they all make the point, and I think you're really going to enjoy them. So listen up very carefully. Now, I want to tell you about Norman Selby. Norman Selby was born in 1874 in Moscow, Indiana. Now, as he grew up to be a young man, um, he developed an interest in boxing, joined a couple boxing gyms, and uh, became a sparring partner to some of the very well-known boxers of the day. And uh, suffered brutal punishment by several of them, and, and he swore he'd always get back. He became a professional boxer and changed his name to Kid McCoy. Kid McCoy. And Kid McCoy became so good, he became the middleweight champion of the world at one point. And in fact, in 1958... Time Magazine said he was one of the 100 greatest punchers of all time. All right? But here's what he did. Here's, he, had a, he had a few peculiarities about him that you need to know about. He's a very interesting figure in history. He developed the corkscrew punch. Now, the corkscrew punch is a punch that is simply uh, a turning of the wrist shortly, just, just right before it makes impact of the body to the face. And it tears the flesh. It rips apart the opponent. And in fact, he was known for being able to cut up and slice and dice his opponents. Uh, and he, he developed this corkscrew punch after he was riding the rails one day. He was very exhausted. He slipped into a barn. And while he was resting, he saw a cat pawing at a ball of string. And he decided to mimic its motions. And, um, and then that's how he developed that. You still see boxers do that to this day. It's a very common punch. I think they all do it. Um, the other thing about him that was very peculiar was he had a way of playing the game that most people didn't. Whenever he knew he was up against somebody, and I don't know that he did it that often, but I know he did it at least uh, several times, maybe maybe a handful of times. Uh, whenever, whenever he's up against somebody that um, was formidable, somebody that who, who really had the advantage in numbers over him. What he would do was he would uh, powder his face with flour, and he would let it leak out to the press that um, that he wasn't feeling well, and he knew that this would get back to his opponent. You know, this would happen. This would take place a week or so prior, maybe a couple weeks prior to entering the ring, and um, and so his opponent would underestimate him. And they would overestimate their own abilities, which they probably already did anyway, because they know they're good, right? So they would slack. They would not train as hard. 
they would not take him as seriously. And uh, what Kid McCoy ultimately did was he made them weaker by making himself weaker. He didn't underestimate his opponent, but he made his opponent underestimate himself. You know, he got his opponent to overplay their hand. And he would go in there and he would defeat them. Now, this happened just often enough to make the press suspicious. So before he would enter the ring, you know, maybe the day prior, the night before, they would uh, print in the newspaper, is this the real McCoy? Is this the real McCoy? Is he really sick or is he well? Is this a game he's playing or, or what, what's going on here? Is this the real McCoy? In fact, that's where we get the phrase. That's where we get the saying. I'm sure you've heard it before. But Kid McCoy, I think uh, even he overplayed his hand at some point. You see, he ended up marrying 10 times. You know, there, So that tells me there's at least 10 women out there that uh, didn't fall for his ruse. I don't really necessarily know how that played out, but I thought it was an interesting fact to bring up. In fact, he um, he became an alcoholic. I guess if you were married 10 times, you would too. But he became an alcoholic. He um, He ended up robbing a bank, shot a man in the process. And uh, at some point, one of his wives ended up suspiciously murdered in his, one of his homes. And uh, he had to defend himself in trial. Didn't do a very good job. Went to San Quentin. And in 1935, he was released on parole. And then he went to work for Ford Motor Company. A less than lustrous career. So I would say that even though Kid McCoy was good in the ring, he knew how to make the, his opponent overplay their hand. He himself overplayed his own hand. You've always got to be sharpening your skills. You've always got to be paying attention. And you've got to know that some people can play through your ruse. You can't always be playing the game the same way. I guess the story kind of speaks to the fact that uh, weakness can be an advantage. But you can't always be strong. You can't always be weak. You can't always be the alpha, despite what you hear on a lot of videos. It's important to mix it up because if you don't, you're going to become very predictable. And everybody's going to figure out your game and you'll be taken down. Whether you're playing it weak or playing it strong, you need to mix it up. Now, the second illustration I have for you that comes from real life also, it's a little funny. It's a little funny and it's a little odd. And it's just odd enough that I think you'd like to hear it. This comes from a small blurb in a newspaper in 1925. Um, it's about a cat and a mouse. And you figure out who overplayed their hand here. Here's what happened. In Brooklyn, the tall Persian cat of one Mrs. Ann Kaikhofer chased a mouse this way and that, around the garbage cans, under the kitchen table, quartered him by the scuttlebutt. There began to toy with him in the remorseless, sadistic fashion of tall Persian cats with small, timid mice. Suddenly, the tiny creature, deranged by terror, turned upon his tormentor like a lion, scrabbled into the cat's mouth, choked it to death by choking to death within it. Figure that one out. Who overplayed their hand? Well, we could say the cat did, but it seems quite clear and apparent that the cat would have the advantage, but he underestimated the mouse. And the mouse, well, he wasn't a very good student of the game because he hung himself by his own petard. If you're not aware and you're not playing the game right, if you're not smart enough to sit back and study it and study your opponent, and then whatever, whatever circumstance you're up against, because often, oftentimes your circumstances are your opponents, right? Sometimes it's your relationships that you're in. If you don't study these things, if you don't, if you don't make a very careful study of these things and try to figure them out and with the best ways to approach it, you can find yourself destroying yourself, take yourself down, hang yourself by your own petard. And uh, that's not to anyone's benefit. I think you see both go down in flames. Now, the third one here is, like I said, rather silly. Now, I've told you about James Thurber before. James Thurber wrote very funny short stories, very eccentric. It's kind of like Lemony Snicket, but this is a very good illustration. I want to share it with you here, so bear with me. This is called The Unicorn in the Garden. All right, here we go. 
The Unicorn in the Garden. Once upon a sunny morning, a man who sat in a breakfast nook looked up from his scrambled eggs to see a white unicorn with a golden horn quietly cropping the roses in the garden. The man went up to the bedroom where his wife was still asleep and woke her. There's a unicorn in the garden, he said, eating roses. She opened one unfriendly eye and looked at him. The unicorn is a mythical beast, she said, and turned her back on him. The man walked slowly downstairs and out into the garden. The unicorn was still there. He was now browsing among the tulips. Here, unicorn, said the man, and he pulled up a lily and gave it to him. The unicorn ate it gravely. With a high heart, because there was a unicorn in his garden, the man went upstairs and roused his wife again. The unicorn, he said, ate a lily. His wife sat up in bed and looked at him coldly. You are a booby, she said, and I'm going to have you put in the booby hatch. The man, who had never liked the words booby and booby hatch, and who liked them even less on a shiny morning when there was a unicorn in the garden, thought for a moment. We'll see about that, he said. He walked over to the door. He has a golden horn in the middle of his forehead, he told her. Then he went back to the garden to watch the unicorn, but the unicorn had gone away. The man sat down among the roses and went to sleep. As soon as the husband had gone out of the house, the wife got up and dressed as fast as she could. She was very excited and there was a gloat in her eye. She telephoned the police and she telephoned the psychiatrist. She told them to hurry to her house and to bring a straitjacket. When the police and the psychiatrist arrived, they sat down in chairs and looked at her with great interest. My husband, she said, saw a unicorn this morning. The police looked at the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist looked at the police. He told me it ate a lily, she said. The psychiatrist looked at the police, and the police looked at the psychiatrist. He told me it had a golden horn in the middle of its forehead. At a solemn signal from the psychiatrist, the police leaped from their chairs and seized the wife. They had a hard time subduing her, for she put up a terrific struggle, but they finally subdued her. Just as they got her into the straitjacket, the husband came back into the house. Did you tell your wife you saw a unicorn? asked the police. Of course not, said the husband. The unicorn is a mythical beast. That's all I wanted to know, said the psychiatrist. Take her away. I'm sorry, sir, but your wife is as crazy as a jaybird. So they took her away, cursing and screaming, and shut her up in an institution. The husband lived happily ever after. The moral of the story? Don't count your boobies until they're hatched. So who do you think overplayed their hand in the story? Well, it seems like the husband would have, right? Because he made his wife think he was crazy. But she underestimated him. She was so caught up with her resentment and disrespect for him that she always thought herself way stronger than him and, and saw a moment in which she could take great advantage. She didn't think he was smart enough to figure out how to play the game. And that's very dangerous. If you think that you're the only one who's making a careful study, that you're the only one who's improving your game, you're wrong. You see, if you are always the winner, if you're always the strong one, you're going to be very predictable and people are going to make a study of you and they're going to think and you're going to think that you have the advantage but they're going to take you down so be very careful and never overplay your hand guys i hope you've enjoyed this video i hope it's meant something to you if it has hit the thumbs up button hit the like button subscribe and do me a huge favor please share it on facebook twitter um, instagram let people know about this channel, that you liked what you saw. And um, I will catch you in the next one. I'll be ever, forever grateful to you for it. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.